Good heavens. <laughs> we're keep that in. Keep that in. All right. Is there a bloopers reel for this? Or, uh, well, there will be. All right. All right. Welcome to Security Guy Radio Black Hack 2016. What's your name, sir? Stephen Grossman. I'm VP of Program Management at Bay Dynamics. What does Bay Dynamics do? So Bay Dynamics does cyber risk analytics. We have a platform that helps you bring all your data together, your threat data, your vulnerability data, as well as your asset data especially, which is the most important part. Right. And it gives you a risk-based view of your world. Now, I looked at your website, and you seem a little different than most of the companies that are in this space because you seem to be gathering everything. You're seeing assets. You're looking at you know, records. And there was a lot of things you gathered. Is that a little different than some of the competition? It is. Can we look at just one thing, maybe. Yeah, that's, that's really so true. I mean, we came out of the UEBA space way back when. What we realized is that UEBA, User Behavior Analytics, is really just a tool and a means to an end. What clients really wanted was a risk-based approach so they could prioritize what they had to do, both around vulnerabilities and threats, right. based on their asset value and based on the actual risk. Now, how new is this? So, I mean, the tool's been around for uh, about three or four years now. Uh, our current platform has been out for about six months, the latest version, and we're actually coming out with a, a new version at the end of the month. In the business, is this a, new, a newer way to look at things? It used to be, oh, there's a guy trying to get in. Let's stop him. Now it's let's catch him before he gets in, and we're going to use this data to find patterns, find people. Is it artificial intelligence and machine learning, or, not, or is it more database rela relational database analysis? So it's actually a combination of, of unsupervised machine learning, okay. value at risk analytics, and just data correlation. And what we do is when we bring the, all that data together, what it really enables you to do, is, as you're saying, is think about things in the big picture and be able to prioritize them based on risk. And so... As we've all recognized, large companies aren't going to be able to avoid being breached. Right. They're not going to be able to patch every vulnerability and address every threat as soon as they hit the uh, hit the wire. And so they need to prioritize what they do so that it impacts their business as, le as least as possible. So when you're looking and taking in all the, the data feeds, the logs, the uh, user behavior, is this really a goal aimed at post-breach or pre-breach in a proactive manner? That's a great question. So, I mean, it's really focused on, on both. And so being able to understand the risk of your assets, the threats that are addressing them, the behavior of the people, then the pe behavior of the machines, together with the vulnerabilities, allows you to be proactive in protecting them. And it also gives you the ability after the fact as well to, to do forensics. That's what I was going to ask. The exact same question. Now, let's talk about volume. How much of this data? We just talked to some network people, right? That said, look, let's be honest. I got a billion hits on these networks. I can't catch everybody, but I can write some code that says, let's look at this type of threat. This is a little different because you already have the data there. You're just going to analyze it. What kind of volume can it do? Is this scalable? Can I, can I use it for a medium company? And, of course, can I use it for a worldwide company? You know, is it scalable? It is, and it's a really an interesting question because you know we're impl implemented and deployed at some of the largest companies in the world, the largest banks, largest media companies, and people tend to think of packet capture and, and number of packets hitting the network and the number of transactions a section, second you could hit. But in reality, if you really look at user behavior, it's really about their web activity and their authentication right. activity, data exfiltration activity. And similarly, on the vulnerability side, the data volumes are really just not that huge. Right. right? It's different. It's different. Yeah. It's a different approach. Now, it used to be uh, back in the day when we were buying laptops for $5,000 that I put something on. It's called LoJack for laptops now. It used to be called something else, right? And, you know, oh, we can't put that on our laptop because it costs too much money. And I'll just let one or two laptops get stolen and so on, right? Is this getting to a point where it's, you know, if Disney can buy it, can... Sharice's company buy it. Is it scalable on cost? Because I think everybody should have this, but maybe you can't afford it. I'm not asking you to give me prices on quotes, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? Sure. So, and, and it's really not a pricing issue, right? We're, we're very flexible on pricing. Okay. We scale it by the size of the company. Actually, it, it's really somewhat of a maturity issue. And so being able to have the underlying tools, we don't actually do the detection of the activity on the edge, and we don't do the detection of the exfiltration. We take all that data together from your existing investments, and bring that together in, in order to, to really yeah. benefit. And so, for example, a, a press release just came out today about a partnership with FishMe, right? Where we're, we're helping them be better, right? Oh, and so FishMe does a great job. Of, I saw of them here at the show. Of, of testing, uh, of testing different uh, users on, on their phishing uh, competency and clicking on the link, right. right? And what we do is based on users' behavior, give them a list of the most risky users 
to be to be uh, dealing in, in those kind of behaviors. And so by feeding them that list, they're able to hit the, the most riskiest users and test the, the, those users uh, before everybody else. So this, this technology, how is this different from what I think is very common and well understood in, in, in our space from a GRC type tool that can do similar da data log, collectivity, co correlation, and you have your assets, you have you can do the, the BA feeds, etc. What is Bay Dynamics doing different? So Bay Dynamics bridges the, the gap between your GRC and your SIM tools. Okay. And so GRC is great at, at pulling those logs together and, and uh, dealing with your findings and dealing with, with your risk logs. What they're not great about is dealing with the really high volumes of vulnerabilities and prioritizing them and being able to action them. And similarly, the SIM tools don't do a great job uh, of the behavioral analytics and being able to communicate that, that data out. And so Risk Fabric is able to communicate to everybody from the person who, who's a repeat offender accidentally violating policies doing their job up to the SOC, all the way up to the board of directors, being able to give them a risk approach, a risk-based approach to, to their investments and how they're investing in security. That's, that's a really good explanation of the differentiation. Let's talk a little bit more on that risk approach. Does your technology take in the policies, configurations of those, let's say, critical assets to be able to create that risk profile based on the state? We do. So we take in the technical profiles of, of the machines and we're able to understand the mapping of those machines from the servers to the machines and the applications to the business, right? And so when a vulnerability or a threat hits a machine, you, you know whether it's a dev machine sitting in a lab or whether it's a production machine that's your trading system that you really want to be taking care of first. That's a differentiating factor that's not common on the market space right now with more of the popular type, no, better known GRC tools that claim to, to help with risk remediation. Absolutely. I mean, we work with the popular GRC tools and the popular SIM tools and really bridge that gap to make it actionable for everybody in the organization. Even though it's really fundamental to, to any kind of really effective security management, most companies, even large companies and very mature companies, don't really have their asset data really well organized and, and aligned. And, and so what we do as part of the implementation is work with the company to gather that information and put together a process. And we've actually, you know, we, we call part of our product the security configuration management database, actually, because exactly that fact is that it's so hard for companies to, to understand that, that data, having it in one place in a, in a logical, hierarchical fashion and understanding the risk behind it. You know, you could actually browse the risk in, in the Risk Fabric uh, database according to your entities and your machines and your applications. What's the biggest problem you're finding internally in companies that employees are doing? Is it just they're sloppy with their authentication? Is it malicious, or what is the biggest Not issue? Yeah. So I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, the the uh, in terms of volume, it's certainly the, the non-malicious repeat offenders, people just doing the job, and either being uh, lackadaisical about being able to actually uh, send the data out, or, or about going, what websites they're going to, or their business process is kind of broken, and it's the only way they can get their job done. So from a volume point of view, they're probably the, the greatest volume. But from a damage point of view, right, it's the bad guys. And so the trick is being able to get rid of the, that noise uh, from, from the non-malicious folks so that you can really focus in on the bad guys. And so we have programs like Just-In-Time Training that will identify those non-malicious repeat offenders and automatically sign them up for training. That's kind of in line with, well, that's with, a good with idea. The, it's in line with the FishMe partnership yeah. as well, where it will automatically sign them up for appropriate training. It's like seven-minute training specific to the policies that they're violating. And, and so in doing so, they're able, to, uh, they're able to really target. Again, it's targeting the riskiest people in the right way and, and actioning them uh, as soon as possible. How do you handle that culturally? Because it's, you know, a big brother thing. Do the companies let employees know that this is what's in place and you got to behave? Or when an offender comes up, they pull them in the little room and say, come here, i got to talk to you. You know, to turn, Come over here and sit down in this chair with this bright light. Because uh, I could see some companies would absolutely not adopt this from a cultural point of view. You know, and it's a great question. I mean, it, it, it's certainly an issue uh, within large companies, but I don't think anybody really has a large expectation uh, of privacy in, in that regard these days. Everybody knows their email is being monitored, and everybody knows it their, their, their yeah, web true. access is being monitored. And so, if you do it in a constructive way, I mean, what's really nice is, is you know the way it works out is they get a very they don't have to sit through two hours of you know you're being punished sit through two hours right. of mandatory training. Here's here's a seven minute uh, seven minute training that'll tell you why it's negatively impacting your employer, right, which is going to impact your job. And in doing so, it really is a constructive thing that helps people uh, improve. We've seen we've seen incredible results. I mean, we've seen like 80% drop 
I was those, just going to ask that question. In those non-malicious behaviors right. in three months. So you can look at the metrics and say, we used to have all these things, and now we're 80% lower. That's it, a huge impact. That's a great metric for ROI. Yeah. It is, and, and that's actually, I mean, a very large part of our product is not only be able to communicate and reduce your risk, but being able to, to measure it, right? And so being able to engage those programs, involve those programs with those end users, and then monitor their behavior afterwards to show their improvement or not. Um, along the way is, is hugely beneficial. So if 80% uh, of breaches now are due to bring your own device, which is probably outside the company after hours mostly, I would guess, um, does that help address issues like that? In other words, they're not, I mean, they're on the network, they're maybe on a VPN connection. Are we monitoring their behavior off duty with their phone? Coming and, so, and going across the network. And so we're not actually monitoring anybody's behavior, right? We're taking in data from all the other edge tools that are actually doing the monitoring. No, but, but is that in captured large, somewhere? There, or? Yeah, I mean, there are in, in large companies that have good BYOD programs, right? Not everybody does, because it's, it's really right. an emerging issue, even though it's been around for a few years. Uh, the, the large companies that have these programs in place do have tools at the edge that are doing some monitoring to the work side of those devices and, and, and uh, feeding that back as well. What kind of savings are we looking at? Or let, let me phrase it another way. What is a cost for bad behavior? Are there statistics on an average company wastes $80 million a year on you know, bad logins and poor performance and all those kind of things? How do you show that return on the investment to them? I know the numbers drop on performance and the performance gets better, but is there some kind of tangible number on those things? We don't tend to talk in, in ROI directly, because okay. ROI for, for security is always kind of a, well, a, a, a tricky, to tricky it's topic. It's an oxymoron, that's right. But what we can talk about is return on investment of your to, to the tools, right? And so when you look at, at the impact of diff bad behavior and the impact of, of breaches, which are well documented, everybody knows if yeah. 10,000 social security numbers get stolen, it's going to cost you so much for, for monitoring, it's going to cost you so much in fines, so much in lawsuits. It's very easy to quantify that as opposed to the, the investment you're going to make to, to mitigate it. And then being able to, to measure the fact that it actually got mitigated is really the, the key to bridging that gap. So when I talk to C-level people, I'm amazed at what they, I don't know, what they didn't know, they thought they didn't know, they weren't sure they knew. Are you opening up eyes and boardrooms on this kind of stuff? You know, if I'm a C guy and I'm hiring you to be my VP, I'm expecting you to do your job. Doesn't always happen though, right? Is the C level getting involved with this sort of information or, or is it still at the CISO level? So, so it's actually up and down the chain and, and what's interesting is because of the fact that most large companies are doing this very manually and so they have large teams of people dumping data out into Excel spreadsheets, loading that data into another database, Put, putting together a report yeah. on top of it. What, what happens is two things. Number one, the data's a month old by the time it hits the sea level. Right. And the other problem is, is that bias inherently creeps in, right? People want to tell the story they want to tell, whether that's a positive story to kind of say that they're doing a great job or a negative story to scare them into spending more money, <laughs> right? right? And so yeah. you know, b bias creeps in inherently when you do a manual reporting, whereas this is all automated. This is, you know, tomorrow you're going to get the same exact metric you're getting today off the, off the different data. How do you handle uh that data being compromised. In other words, you point me as administrator, who's watching the administrator to make sure that they're not monkeying with the data? Monkeying the data coming into risk fabric? Well, it's their data, but in, in other words, can they interfere with how the data is analyzed on if they're, if they're the administrator of the program? Well, so, I mean, ultimately somebody always has the, the ultimate uh, system administrator access, right? Using checks and balances, yeah. separation of, uh, of roles, but by uh, separating the database administrator from the data administrators. Everything within Risk Fabric is all access controlled, so only the right people are seeing the right data okay. for them. So the, the CISO is seeing the right dashboards that he wants to see. And I was just say, I'm a very visual person, so reports, the dashboards are very important. It's kind of like the root of the, the values of these data analysts. What kind of visualization is your counter offer? So our dashboarding offers a full range of your typical typical visualizations across the different kinds of radar, radar charts and bar graphs and pie charts. But more importantly, they're all drillable and they're all very navigatable by anybody who picks it up. So it's very obvious when you're looking at a chart of your risk organizations by the, their users, their employees' behavior. And you double click on that bar, you'll see a list of those employees. You right mouse click on that employee, you'll see a profile of all the behavior and the riskiness of that behavior, as well as the behavioral analytics about how risky it is relative to their past history. Not only on their employees, what about the end devices, the, the technology, the servers, the routers, the switches? Do you get like a map, visual map of where your highest 
priority critical assets are? So that's a great question. So we don't do a visual map of the network because that's not really our, our thing per se. What we do provide you with is lists and underlying data of your riskiest endpoints. And so we see it really as one big landscape and being able to understand if you're looking at a, a user that's engaging in risky behavior, and then you see that that user has a lot of endpoint events on his machine, pivoting over to the machine and seeing the vulnerabilities on that machine, it's all available in a kind of stream of consciousness click-through, gives you the full picture of understanding whether it's a, a user who's doing the wrong thing or whether it's a machine that has a virus. Um, and, and so being able to do that stream of consciousness click-throughs in a very guided, navigated way, and we have freeform tools as well to do freeform analytics, but that really has been a big hit, especially with the executive suite that likes to see the data, touch the data, drill down on the data, but not have to worry too much about the, the functionality and the, the navigation of the tool. Sorry, I get what you're saying, because I like Denny's. Because <laughs> I like the pictures on the menu. It's easier for me to order, right? That's my age group. It's, it makes sense. It's easy to understand. It is true. It is true. Picture, picture's worth a thousand words. That's right. Steve, this has been a great conversation. Give us your website. It's uh, www.baydynamics.com. Excellent. And uh, what's the next big thing on, on the plate? Any, any, any next level this is working towards in this kind of field? Absolutely. So version 5.0 is coming out at the end of the month. Excellent. And that's going to have our entity navigator where you can navigate to, to our riskiest, riskiest entities and have more value-based analytics. When you say riskiest entities, you say you mean bad employee? Is that bad another way to say it? That's what bad, I would well, say. Bad, bad employees, <laughs> bad, bad vendors. Oh, that's a good point, vendors. Let's let's so, uh, let's not wrap up yet. Tell me how you're helping with the vendor piece. So if the vendor has access to, I don't know, SAP, uh, you're watching him too because he's in that space using that data. Interesting. Absolutely. And what we're able to do is roll that up by vendor. And so, for example, the vendor management folks are able to understand which vendors on their list that they have to review yeah. have been engaged in the riskiest behaviors on their network, right? And so when you have 10,000 vendors as, as some clients we have, uh, you know, have operating in-house, they have to prioritize what they do. Right. And so understanding how vendors who are a risky group to begin with are, are, are uh, behaving is, is really key. And then again, pushing out that communication. So we could push out the communication if the client wants to, to the vendor's manager. Tell the vendor's manager that, hey, Stephen Grossman's behaving badly on my network. Can you please take care of it? Because you're my partner and I want, you know, I want to do good business with you. Please make sure your employees are behaving properly. I always feel better when I talk to people who are smarter than me. It's brilliant. Steve, thanks for coming on the show. It's My been pleasure. really good. And uh, maybe we'll come in and do an hour show if you have a chance. That would be great. Can Skype in. Yeah, this is really a deep subject. I think it would be really interesting to have people drill down. And you can give us some uh, case success stories. That would be great. Thanks Look for coming on Security Guy Radio. Thanks so much. All right.